Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the She's Making an Impact podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Ngom. I'm so excited for today's episode. Oh my goodness. Um, We brought on Mel Abraham. If you don't know him, um, you're about to just be like so many knowledge bombs are being thrown at you. He is just... (sighs) <sighs> okay, huge. Like I read his book years ago when we were living in France and I'm like, now I'm interviewing on the podcast. I was kind of fangirling. Um, he's a CPA by education, uh, entrepreneur by acceleration. He's an author of the number one bestseller, The Entrepreneur Solution, The Modern Millionaire's Path to More Profit, Fans and Freedom. Um, I I could go through his entire bio, but what you need to know is he has just such a heart for helping entrepreneurs create more wealth and achieve financial freedom. So that's exactly what we're diving into in today's episode. So you don't have to work for the rest of your life and you can create a money machine and just enjoy your life. So enjoy this and make sure tag me and Mel on Instagram, um, me at she's making an impact and let us know your thoughts and your biggest takeaways from today's episode. Let's dive in. Hey, Mel, welcome to the show. Oh, gosh, Rachel, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, let's just start off. Tell us a little bit about you, what you do. Well, I am a, I am a CPA by education, but, uh, but the fact is I've been an entrepreneur. I got, I got triggered with the entrepreneur bug at 11 years old, and uh, I, was, I started to do magic shows for kids' birthday parties at 11 years old, getting paid 50 bucks for a half hour show. And, and so that's that pretty was, good for an 11 really year old. Cause if I, if I go back, that was like 1972. Yeah. So, so that was a lot of money for an 11 year old at any 11 year old at any time. But, yeah. uh, but I think the big thing for me was, was like, Oh, I realized you could make money doing something you loved and impacting people's lives. And, you know, whether it's putting a smile on a face or, or changing things. And that's, stayed with me. And, and I always knew that I wanted to do something on my own. And I, and, and so I I wanted to learn business. I needed to understand that. And so that's kind of where I went through this, the CPA realm, but I realized really quickly that the ticking and tying and the boredom of a CPA (laughs) is not for me. So so I, I I said, you know, I've got a skill set. Let's take that skill set and let's help other people literally, you know, how do we help other people bring their dreams to life? You know, yeah. and, and knowing that in my belief, entrepreneurs and businesses impact the world. And yep. so that's, that's kind of what I've been doing for, for decades now. Um, yeah. And it's, it's where I, it's where I find my joy. Yeah. I love it. And sorry, if you can hear my dog snoring in the background, oh, that's all right. <laughs> there's, there's a better than barking. <laughs> There's a possibility you may hear my dog and we just got our granddaughter for the next four days. And so oh, that's fun. And so she's in the room next door. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Um, So you've had quite the journey over the course of your your several decades in business. And recently you kicked cancer's butt. Um, Can you talk to us about that and just what that was like and what you learned from it? Uh, there was so, <laughs> there was so many lessons. So here's the thing: if we go back a ways uh, as to be just before this happened, life was good. My business was going well. I was speaking on all the the big stages around the world. I was masterminding with uh, top entrepreneurs, hundred million dollar, billion billion dollar businesses. I literally just flew back from Puerto Rico in a mastermind on a private G five. Okay. And if you've never done that, you got to do it once and just make sure someone else pays for it because (laughs) it's not cheap. And so, you know, here I am stepping off this plane thinking that everything is just hitting. Everything's good. And I go into the doctor and they, they give me the news. They say, we see a five centimeter tumor on a CT scan in your bladder. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, what is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So, it means that 98% chance you have cancer. And I go, I don't smoke. I didn't drink, I very rarely drink. I had a healthy lifestyle, I, you know, other than a sweet tooth. No one in my family had cancer, but it, literally the whole, my whole life got just turned upside down. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, sitting with this, the surgeon, the actual, the second doctor, the surgeon that was actually gonna do the work, he said, look, 
as I'm, as I'm ready to get wheeled in, he says, you realize this is on top of the prostate. So we might have to remove the prostate. It's blocking the ureter on one side. So we might have to put a tube and a bag in for the kidney for, for a time. And if it's bad, there's a chance you lose your bladder. I'm, I mean, so all the things that I thought were important, all the things is it, it, like people said, well, you got your priority straight. I said, yeah. Do you realize that there are, there isn't a priority list. There's just one priority and it's life and it's living it and it's embracing it, you know? And, and so that surgery turned out that it wasn't five centimeters. It was seven and a half centimeters. <laughs> it took him six and a half hours to take it out. I'd been through uh, three surgeries, four tumors removed. I am actually, as we speak, I'm in my, I've had 45 treatments. I will have my 46th treatment tomorrow. Wow. It's a preventative proactive treatment, but I've been clear of the cancer for two years now, and we're just trying to make sure it doesn't come back. We're, we're attacking it. We're, we're playing offense now, and we're doing things to make sure that it doesn't come back. But it was in that process where I realized, one, I had to fight the cancer uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, energetically, all of those things psychologically, but I didn't have to fight it financially. Mm. And that was June of 2019. Yeah. Um, and then shortly after that, we all know what happened to the world with the pandemic. And I watched a lot of folks struggle with the pandemic financially. Mm -hmm. And here I was, you know, dealing with the cancer, shutting down. The, we shut down my businesses so I could solely focus on healing. Mm -hmm. But we were set up financially in a way that it didn't change our lifestyle. And I wasn't draining my accounts. I wasn't selling things. I wasn't selling my wife's shoes. If I sold my wife, if I sold my wife's shoes, it would be a fate worse than the cancer, just so we would clear. <laughs> okay. um, <True. laughs> so, so, you know, the, the things, but I realized that so many people struggled during that pandemic that didn't need to, if they had done things differently, and I'm not going to say right, just differently. Mm -hmm. And it isn't their fault. It's society's fault. It's the media's fault. It's social media's fault. We don't want to have these conversations around money. We don't want to have a dialogue about something that is important because maybe we got demonized because of money or it's dirty or it's greedy. But if we're truly going to live a life that is peaceful and free, there needs to be a funding mechanism, mechanism and it's money. So it's not about the money that matters. It's about the enrichment of life that money will give you that matters. And that's the thing that, that kind of came full circle where I had been living my life and I had very close friends prior to the cancer saying, you need to go teach people how you, you built the financial side. You know, my son is 31, going to be 32 with his Wife is 29, going to be 30. They've got their first child. And here they are at that young age with three homes and a multi-million dollar net worth. And they're saying, how did you teach people? Why are you not teaching? And I said, I don't want to be looked at as a CPA. But it was the cancer and the pandemic that said, oh, I get it. Whatever the power above you that you believe in. I said, I get it. I, this is what my new season is. It's taking those skills and coming back to it and saying, how do you give peace to people on the financial side? And that's kind of how I ended up where I'm, where I am today. Wow. Whew. All right. We're just kicking it off with a bang. That's some powerful stuff already, Mel. Um, if you were to go back to 34 year old you, so I'm 34, my husband's 35. What piece of advice would you give yourself back then? I think that for me, if I looked at it, uh, is one, and I'll, and I'll do this in someone in a, in a story. What in 2009, I got in a bike accident. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a, you, the whole, your whole community is going to go, don't get close to Mel. He gets into accidents. <laughs> he gets cancer. Um, but I flipped the bike. Uh, I was riding the bike to the gym my shoelace got caught it flipped i ended up on my head i had a grade four concussion i was in a neck brace 
And I had a dear, dear friend who retired at 36 years old. And he said to me, he says, I'm coming over. I'm taking you to lunch. I said, great. So we're sitting at lunch and we just, we barely sit down and he looks me in the eye. We grew up together and he says, how much is enough? And I go, what are you talking about? And he says, he says, how much is enough? And I said, enough what? He says, listen, the reason you got in the bike accident is because you got on the bike distracted. You got on the bike angry. You got on the bike stressed and you just started to ride and you were going to continue to ride because you don't know where your finish line is. And if you don't know where your finish line is, once you heal from this, you'll get back on the bike and ride it again. And, and it dawned on me that he was right. I didn't know what success looked like. I didn't know what my finish line was. I didn't define it. I didn't know what I wanted my life to look like. And I was sitting back chasing the dollars, chasing the accomplishments, but never knowing or giving myself credit for having made it. And so I think the first thing I would say uh, to, to you is, is, do you have a definition? Not that you'll be finished, but do you have a definition of what the finish line looks like, the lifestyle, the experience? And one of the things that I talk about a lot is, is I think critical outcome to live an affluent life is, is having a richer lifestyle. And, I, and I'm intentionally using the term richer versus wealthy because wealth is a statistic. Richer is an experience and it's a feeling. And so, so to have that conversation between an intimate couple and say, what do we want to experience together for the next three, four decades of our life? And knowing that that's what we're moving towards. And then we can then overlay the price tag to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we start going after the price tag and we don't even know what we're trying to make happen. And so I think one of the first things we do is to get very clear on what we want that life to look like before we start going after something, because we may be on a journey that isn't the journey that was meant for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So get clear on what we want, then how do we even get close to figuring out what that number could be? <laughs> well, that takes a little bit of, of one research to it's guessing because you look, you're looking at at least 40 years or more, maybe. Mm -hmm. So how do we know what things are going to cost them? So right. you're going to, so one of the things you look at is say, we're going to use estimates. We're going to do some things that allow us to adjust as we go, as we get more information. And so a lot of times people don't want to make a decision because they're afraid to make a wrong decision. Mm -hmm. But the reason we make a decision isn't to set a direction. The reason we make the decision is to get more information so we can make a better decision. And as we make those better decisions, now we set the direction. And so I think the first thing to do is say, well, what do we want? Like, for instance, we just, like my wife and I, when we sat down and, and did this, we love to travel. Okay. And, and I just, I pulled a number out of the air and I said, I want minimum $50,000 a year travel. And I just, I just looked, I said, you know, that's $12,500 or so every quarter for us to go travel. We can do a decent trip for that, you know? Now, have we adjusted it? Yes. You know, and so we set a thing in place because we started looking and say the kind of trips we want to take, let's just use that number as a benchmark for now. And then we refined it as we got closer and closer. And now we have an idea of when we travel, what things we want to do. Like we at some point want to go and just spend a month in Tuscany. And so we fun. plan for that. And we start to look at that. So there are things that sometimes you're just going to make a, a somewhat educated guess. And then there's those that you're going to look at and you can, and this is where a, a planner can help, uh, where you start to look at, well, we got to plan for medical costs when we get older. Mm -hmm. And the expectation or the statistics show that medical costs in your retirement years can accumulate to almost $200,000 a person. Well, 
that's a scary statistic when you look at the fact that most people have less than a hundred thousand dollars saved. Wow. And and so it's so to me, even if we don't get 100 percent to the number we're looking at, looking for, we will by setting a, a target, something, a trajectory, we we will actually get closer than we would have gotten if we did. And so I think the first thing is then once we detail it and say, look, all right, we want travel, we want to buy a house, or we want to buy another house, a second home, or we want a lake house. Uh, um, and you, you'll estimate what those numbers are until you get closer and you start to refine those numbers. And then that's the long-term vision. Mm -hmm. Then we sit back and say, let's just look at it and say, I'm looking at a 10-year vision. I want to bring it back and say, well, what, where do I need to be in five years to hit the 10-year? And then when do I need to be in one year to hit the five year? Mm -hmm. And then what do I need to do every 90 days to hit the one year? And when we start to break it down, the numbers will get more and more precise as we get into that 90 day period. And then every 90 days, what we do is we look at our numbers. I look at my numbers monthly, probably even more often. I'm just an accountant, you know. Um, but every 90 days, we kind of re-look re at it and say, are we on track? What do we need to adjust? What's working? What's not working? We make the adjustment. We keep moving for the next 90 days. And it's, mm -hmm. it's building the long-term vision through 90-day sprints. I love that. Because if you're not intentional about it, it'd be really easy just to wait you know, a decade and then you look and you're like, oh, crap, I'm not anywhere close <laughs> to where I well, need to be. Oh, so and you, you used two things in it that are so important. And if, if the listeners just get this, it, it can change everything for them. One is the word intentional. Mm -hmm. Too often, and I, I'm the first person that I will tell people, like, I don't live, I'm not one of those that says, um, you know, and, and I, I love the guy, Dave Ramsey, you know, and, and everything, but I'm not one saying that, hey, y'all live on beans and rice. Now, yeah. if you're in deep trouble, you might have to live on beans and rice till you get out of it. I don't live a lifestyle where we're, you know, uh, we spend money, okay? But we do it responsibly. But I'm never one that's gonna tell someone, don't buy it, typically, okay? If it's really a bad decision, I'll say so. But, but I, don't tell, I don't try not to tell my clients not to buy something. All I want you to do is to be fully aware fully conscious and fully intentional of the decision you make. And here's what I mean by that. You might look at a $200 bill as 200 bucks. I'm gonna go get a car and it's gonna cost me $200 more a month to purchase a car than what I'm paying now. And he says, it's only 200 bucks, I can afford it. And I say, great. The problem is, we're looking at it as a $200 decision. I look at 200 bucks a month and I say, if I invested that over a period of time, that turns into a $350,000 nest egg. Ooh. So now if we consciously and intentionally make the decision to understand that that $200 decision is really a $350,000 decision down the road, and I'm willing to make that, that decision, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But we don't understand what we what we do is we we allow what we want now to get in the way of what we want most. Mm -hmm. And when we start to evaluate through that lens, I, I go to a barber um, and he knows what I do. So we typically talk money and he tells me that his, one of his good friends just bought a five thousand dollar watch. And I go, wow. I said, does he make a lot of money? He says, no, he's 23 years old. And I go, so why'd he buy it? And he said, because his friends thought it was cool. I said, great. I said, let me do some math for you. You invest a dollar at eight to 10% at, in your 20s, and it will turn into almost $90 when you retire. I said, his $5,000 watch, if you do the math, cost him $400,000 at retirement. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that puts I said, did he buy it cash? He says, no, he put it on a credit card. I said, well, no. it's even worse now because he's paying interest on it. Oh. And it's that 
And it's not, I don't, I don't think it's his fault in the sense that we don't talk about it. We don't educate about it. We don't yeah. learn about it. We don't understand it. And we, we fall prey to the comparisons on social media and, and everything else. And we think it's cool. And we never realize that, do I really need the $5,000 watch to impress these people? Or would it be better to have almost half a million dollars at retirement? Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When you look at it that way, uh, it just makes sense. Right. Um, yeah. So we're entrepreneurs. How can we build wealth with our businesses without, you know, having to work our businesses for the rest of our lives? I love this. Oh, okay. So here's the thing. Most entrepreneurs, including me, so I am not exempt from this, come to our business going, I'm getting into business because I want control. I want freedom and I want wealth. And, and in the process of making an impact. And it doesn't take very long when you get in your business to realize hey, nothing's further from the tooth, <laughs> you know? And here's, here's the reality of it all. Your business was never meant to give you freedom. It was meant to bring a solution to a marketplace to have an impact and improve the human condition and to create a cash flow stream. That's the business machine. The problem is, is that most entrepreneurs don't realize that we need to create the second machine called a money machine. Mm -hmm. And that second machine is built from the cash flow from the first machine, the business machine. And when you do that right, your freedom is sitting in the money machine. Mm -hmm. How I was able to shut down my businesses when I got diagnosed and still have the lifestyle and keep the lifestyle was we built the money machine on the side. Now, when I say money machine, it's investments, it's a portfolio, it's, it may be real estate, it could be stocks, it could be combination. So it is something that is not dependent on you. And some people will call it passive. I don't like the term passive because your relationship with money is a relationship. And, you know, I don't know how long you've been married. I've been married 11 years, but I know something for sure. If I took a passive approach to my relationship, it would wither and die. Yeah. And so we never take a passive approach to our money either because it's a relationship. So we take a leverage approach. You mentioned it doesn't take as much time to, uh, to generate it because when we start to build that money machine, then when you need it, like we did, I flipped the switch and it's like an ATM. Mm. We're not eroding the machine. We're taking the cash flow from the machine to live off of. Now that takes a little while. And what that means to entrepreneurs is that as much as you have a line item for advertising, for office expense, for computer expense, there has to be a line item for wealth creation. Mm -hmm. You make it as you said, intentional. You make it part of the planning. If you're in a type of business where you're doing launches, you know what the launch is going to do. You know what you want to do. You know what your ad spend is going to be. Well, part of that launch is a carve off of say 10% that is automatically going into a wealth fund. But until we're intentional about it, we won't create it. And it's possible that maybe you're building a business that's sellable and you get this windfall somewhere down the road. But I've been in buying and selling businesses for decades. And a lot of those deals never come to fruition mm -hmm. or they're never the value you, you want. And, and, uh, and most businesses, especially small businesses, are just not sellable. Mm -hmm. So it becomes our responsibility to create a machine for lifetime income when we decide to step away from the business. And even if we choose not to, I don't intend to retire. I love what I do now and, 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 and always have, but I know that I always have choice. Mm -hmm. And if I have choice and I have options, then I can say, I'm going to work because I love it. I'm going to go do this because I love it. I don't need to do it for the money. Yeah. And That's so we freedom. need to build that out. Yeah, that's freedom. Like having choices yeah. that gives you the freedom of I can do it or, I, but I don't have to, I do it because I love it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, man. So you talked about, I was listening to one of your videos about complacency and investing. Can you talk about the complacency trap and how we can make sure we don't fall into that? Yeah. I, I say complacency is, um, is the first step to crisis. Yeah. And it, and complacency usually hits right about the time that you think you made it Mm. because you have this, what I call the good enough syndrome is good enough. I'm doing good. My bills are paid. Everything's good. I'm, I'm good at, you know, how many people thought we're good enough before the pandemic hit? How many yeah. people thought it was good enough before 2008 hit? Mm. And it's not about, so let me be really clear. It's not about not finding contentment with what you have, mm-hmm. but it's about being as vigilant and diligent with what got you there to make sure that we don't backslide. Mm-hmm. And so what, what tends to happen is that if we cross what we call the good enough line, a lot of times we start to rest on our laurels. We play the game differently and we play the game not to lose instead of to win. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm just saying that I want you to all bring the same energy, the same focus, the same impetus to what you're doing, even though you feel like you made it. And you know what? If you overshoot and you make a ton more, great you have more freedom, you have more ability to get behind missions, movements, be more generous and do more things. But if we're just, like I have a, a, another friend who is just living on the edge, he retired and he's just living on the edge. But if there's a hiccup, inflation, yeah. making things more and more expensive, I don't know about, don't know about you, but our gas prices are approaching seven bucks here. No, yeah, oh, six, wow. six and a half dollars. That's how much. Yeah, we lived in Senegal and in France, and it's it's more than that over there. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're on a fixed income at some point in time, how do you? So this is why I look at things and say, let's say that that I believe that the number for me to retire is a five million dollar nest egg. Mm-hmm. Just I'm picking it out of the air, and that's gonna if I. If I have $5 million and I have, and I can get 5% out of it, it gives, I'll do the math. It gives you 250,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Okay. 20,000 a month. is pretty good. You're doing okay. Um, more than okay. But what happens if we hit a recession, which I have a feeling we may hit. Okay. And we get a 30% decline. Mm-hmm. The 5 million now goes to three and a half million. And now that three and a half million is producing a lot less. But if we're living at the $20,000 a month level, we now can't sustain ourselves without eroding the three and a half million that's left. So I always want to build in a margin for volatility and error so I have room to move. If I, instead of stopping at 5 million, decide that I'm going to push to six and now we, we have a decline, I'm still, I may be less than where I want to be, but I'm not as, as bad as I was going to be. So I don't want to sure. just do enough. I want to get past it to give me the room for error, the room for things that we can't control, like inflation and interest rate hikes and all those things that are completely out of our control. Yep. And, and know that I can still be okay. Yeah. Do you have like a percentage that you would look at for that room for error? Yeah. I typically look at a minimum 15% room for error. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and some of that is dependent upon your situation. For instance, um, I happen to have a disability policy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, for entrepreneurs that are the sole wage earner or sole earner in your family. And, and I don't give all, and I have no, I don't sell investments. I don't sell insurance. I just sell your dreams. That's all I want to do. Okay. And, and insurance companies don't need, need me marketing for them. Um, and most insurance you don't need, but I believe that almost everyone that is an entrepreneur, especially a solopreneur and, a, and, and the primary income earner in their 
household needs to have some level of disability insurance be almost before life insurance the likelihood the percentages the likelihood of being disabled versus dying is far greater especially if you live an active lifestyle and and why this is important is when i when i had the bike accident it was going to take eight months or so for me to get myself back in shape again i had numbness on the right side and and so i have this policy and i had this conversation with the company I negotiated with them. They could pay me monthly or I just negotiated a lump sum. They wrote me a check for over six figures. Oh. So now I could just focus, the bills were paid, everything was taken care of. And so I could just focus on healing again. Now, there's a lot of different uh, variables in that insurance wait time, uh, wait period and all that stuff. But my point is that that if I know I have some of these other stop gaps in place mm -hmm. to insulate me, then, then maybe I bring the margin for error down a little bit. But if okay. I don't, for instance, let's just look at me today. I'm uninsurable because of the cancer. So I'll be 61 this year um, and I need to be five years out of the cancer before they'll even consider me. But by the time I'm five years out of the cancer, I'll be over 65. They go, well, now you're too old. And so I have these other factors. So. I realize that I'm uninsurable. And so if someone out there is sitting back saying, great, Mel, but I'm uninsurable, well, that means that you have to do what's called self-insuring. That means that, that your margin for error might be a little bit higher. We got to push a little bit better so you have the comfort mm -hmm. and you have the peace of mind and you're not stressing and you're not having to deal with, with oh my God, oh my God, and I hope... I hope that I can make it through to the, the next check that's coming in mm -hmm. because we were built on a society th and this all comes about because originally we had, as the industrial age came along in uh, the late 1800s, the military started to create something called pensions, which was lifetime income. And there's still some of that out there. Then American Express created the first private pension, and I think it was 1875. So people would come and work for the company, and then you would get a pension that was lifetime income. You know, my dad had one. My mom's living off of that lifetime income. But it got too expensive for most of these companies to keep. And so they brought in this thing called 401ks and the IRAs and all of that stuff. And it was perceived, I don't know that it was presented because I wasn't really looking at it at that time, but it was perceived as the same thing as lifetime income, but it's not. And unless you use the 401k and the IRAs and all that stuff properly, you won't have enough at the end of the day. And what has happened is what originally was something that was shouldered by the company you were loyal to and that you worked for, um, whether it's government schools or companies in pensions, they moved that responsibility on us individually. Mm -hmm. And now it becomes our job to create lifetime income, but they don't teach us how they tell us save as much as you can. Then when you retire, spend as little as you need and let's hope that your life doesn't outlast last your money. That's a mistake. That's why I say you build a machine. Yep. And I never spend the machine down. I work off of the cash flow of the machine mm -hmm. so it stays intact. And I'm not worried about how long I live. It'll just keep going. And so once I I'm gone, it then transfers to my wife. Once she's gone, it goes to my son and then goes to my granddaughter. It can stay as long as it's managed and done properly. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the catch? The catch is you need to build a bigger nest egg to make that work. Got uh, it. And because if I assume that I'm going to take 5% out every year, it needs to earn, say, 5%, a million dollars in a bank account is only going to get me 50,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. So you may need a couple million depending on lifestyle. Right. But if we do it right and you're out of debt and you, and you do some things, you can bring that down. Mm -hmm. And so 
so the machine may need to be bigger than it would normally do, but now this machine can pass on yeah. and it can, now you don't ever have the issue of time. Right. And that's legacy. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So you talked about inflation and possible recession and war and pandemic. Like there's a lot going on um, oh, there is. in the world. What would you suggest investing in right now? Or what are you investing in right now? Especially with like, there's crypto and like all, all there's so Yeah. Much. Oh, I love this question. So th- there's a couple of things. Let, let me just go through a couple of things. First things first, invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, skill up, learn more, grow more. The more you, uh, the more you are valuable to someone else, the more value you bring, the more you can get paid. We are in a, like it or not, we're in a value exchange economy. You have to provide value and get, you get compensated based on the value you provide. There is no, there is no, entitlement. This might rub some people the wrong way. You're not entitled to a raise without earning it because at some point that equation will not work out. Just because there was time served doesn't mean you're entitled to a raise. Mm -hmm. So it's important to sit back and say, how as an employee, as a person, how do I bring more value to it? And if we just approach life that way, How would it change? How do I bring more value to my relationships? How do I bring more value to to my children, my grandchildren? How do I bring more value to my company? How do I bring value to my customers? Things shift. So I I think that that, that's the the first thing. Second, okay, um, I want to see how order I want to just, let's do do this. We have have the rising interest rates. So let me deal with this piece first. Uh, You've got rising interest rates. Uh, the feds raised it once they say six more times they say that it might go faster and so one of the things that we need to do is we need to get out of any kind of debt that is tied to interest rates that means credit cards if you're carrying balances and and most people are carrying balances average of about six thousand dollars right now uh, on cards carrying balances from month to month the cost of carrying that balance is going to go up as they can continue to in, uh, increase interest rates. So, so we want to get out of that type of debt as quickly as possible. I'm not necessarily talking about the home or the real estate. I'm talking about destructive consumer debt, the stuff that's financing your lifestyle, because that will eat you up down the road when interest rates go up. Then third, I want you to focus on liquidity. I want you to start collecting cash um, because when you have liquidity, you can sustain yourself through inflation, recession, and downtimes. Once I know that I have some liquidity to carry me over, now I want to go into, depending on where the person is at from a um, financial position perspective, will define where you go. Then I would probably go into a broad-based ETF, low-cost ETF to start. I want to, what I want to do is start getting into the investing role in the sense that I want to exercise the investing muscle. Building wealth has got less to do with money and more to do with behaviors. Mm -hmm. And if we start to develop the right behaviors, we can make that work. And that means that we get in the game and we get in the game sooner than later because time is our greatest lever in wealth creation. So I would, if I would start with broad-based ETFs, you know, like an S&P 500. Over time, it's done 8 to 10, sometimes 12%. Yes, in some years, it goes down. Um, But 95% of the time or so, if you look at a 10-year period, it's always going up, Mm -hmm. okay? There will be those couple of years that that get hit. So, and why do I say broad-based? Well, because I want you to have the power and the safety that comes from some level of diversification. And let's just talk about our friends at Facebook, okay? Now I had a big investment in Facebook, but I did it way long ago, pre-IPO. So I got in really cheap, okay? It ran up to close to $400 a share. Mm -hmm. Then they came out with earnings just a, a month or so ago. And they, 
it wasn't as good as they thought. They were having problems with the iOS uh, update and their share price dropped $150 a share. It actually dropped below 200 bucks a share. Wow. Now it's, it's back up above it um, at some level. But why I'm bringing that as an example is that I don't recommend at the very beginning stages of your uh, wealth journey to go into a single stock. If I have a if I have a thousand dollars to invest and I put it in a single stock, or I put it in crypto, and you're getting into volatility and you have a day like Facebook had, and that thousand turns into six hundred, you're screwed. It's a bad day. Yeah, and you're freaked out. Yeah. And the emotions and, 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 and now it's the parade of things that happen after they say, I'm not good at investing. I'm not going to do this. Now you stay out of it and you don't start to build wealth. Whereas if Facebook happens to be one of 500 stocks in the portfolio, yeah, it gets hit, but nowhere close to what it would. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not, if you have an established portfolio and a foundation, great. Take some slices out and you want to invest in individual stocks. Um, and, and everything, and you're doing the analysis and it's not like my mom used to pick horse races by the color of the, the jerseys and the name of the horse and all that stuff. And it's like, that's not how we pick companies. It's not how we pick investments, um, or crypto where it's now at like 47,000 a share or Bitcoin is, and, and it was down at 20 and it could go to 20. And people say, if I put it on, I could be a millionaire in crypto. I said, yes, and you could be a, you could lose it all. Mm -hmm. because it's it's a spec speculative piece so it may be more conservative way to go but but i think it's the right way to go for the long term because if you're kind of going in at this and saying well, i want to i want to make a ton of money in the next 12 months well investing is not your game now you're playing a, a speculative gambler's trading game mm -hmm. you're not playing the investing game remember i said the market goes up you know, in 95% of the time over a 10 year period. So if I'm looking out minimum five, 10 years or more, then I need to just close my eyes to some of the volatility and not get sucked into the emotion and everything. And we do it in a portfolio. At some point, you may be more laser focused on specific companies. Like I do that now but I have a base portfolio and it's sitting in ETFs, it's sitting in index funds, it's sitting in other investments. And then I have this other account. That's my play account. That my, my, my wealth strategy team, they don't, they, they know, they see it. So they see what I'm doing, but, but they leave me alone. They leave it alone and I do my thing. Mm -hmm. But it's, if I looked at it as a percentage of the portfolio, it's probably two and a half percent of my portfolio. So you would say like crypto would be in the two and a half percent. Yes. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's like, everyone's talking about it now. And I'm just like, should we start? I, like, I don't know. I'm like, my husband's like, it's risky. <laughs> well, that I agree. That's the thing is that you, you could, you could potentially start, but it depends on what you have already. Right. And, and if you sat back and said, yeah, that, that would, uh, you know, like I'm trying a crypto strategy, okay, mm -hmm. right now. And I'm only trying it with 2,000 bucks. Yeah. Because I, I don't want to put that much at risk and I could afford to put a lot more at risk. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to mm -hmm. because there's a lot of complexities and unknowns and uncertainties there. Right. And, and they'll say it's, you know, it's cryptocurrency, but it's really not a currency yet. Right. It's, it's a commodity. Okay. And it goes up and down. When you see that kind of volatility, that's, that's a, a scary type of investment. Now, if you sat back and said, Hey Mel, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, what we call dollar cost average into crypto, into Bitcoin or something, $50 a month. You're not putting a lot in, but over time, you know, it, it could, it could grow, mm -hmm. but you're not, you're not betting your whole future on it. Right. I like the two and a half percent. So looking at just like a small percentage of what you're doing. It, it really, 
so there's there's two things in investing. Uh, when when we start to to look at uh, and when I start to help people with a plan and and strategy, I say we need to understand your risk tolerance. Mm-hmm. That is how much can you sustain emotionally, mm-hmm. um, which is what a lot of invest investing advisors will stop there. They say risk tolerance. What what can you tolerate? So you might have someone that's kind of aggressive, like you you see the difference between you and your husband, Mm -hmm. okay? The tolerance level, the acceptance level is different. But there's this other piece called risk capacity. What is the logical, reasonable thing I have the capacity to sustain myself from? Mm -hmm. And so if I have a high risk tolerance, but I'm sitting on only $100,000 in investable assets, my capacity might simply be $2,000, where I, I can lose and keep going mm-hmm. or 10,000. I don't know, mm-hmm. but your tolerance goes, go all in. Mm-hmm. Well, you gotta be aware of the tolerance and the capacity because they got to At some point you got to figure out which one's governing the decision mm-hmm. that you're going to make to get in the game. Got it. Makes sense. Um, what do you think is better, paying off mortgage or investing? I feel like this is a debate that you could go back and forth on. Uh, I know Dave Ramsey says one thing and then other people say another. So I'm yeah, curious so, your so I actually did a, an episode on my show specifically this and did the math on it. OK. Mm-hmm. Typically. So now Dave Ramsey is of the mindset of you get all completely out of debt before you do anything. Okay. Well, I'm not of that same mindset. And, and here's why. Debt management is a muscle just like wealth creation is a muscle, but they're different muscles. They're different mentalities. So if I'm solely focused on debt management, but I never exercise the muscle and the thinking around wealth creation, I postpone it for one. And I'm not developing the skills I need when I got to get there. It's like the guy who goes to the gym and only works out his upper body. He's got twigs on the lower body and a monster up top. It just doesn't look good in shorts, (laughs) you know? So you look at it. And so I think that you need to exercise both. Now, will that delay you getting out of debt? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it'll also put you, accelerate you getting into the investing game. Mm -hmm. And so what that, what that would mean look like is that if I have $500 to go towards debt and investing, I might split it $300 to the debt, $200 going into the investing. Mm -hmm. So with that as a, as a segue to it, how do we deal with the home? We're in a unique situation today. And if you do the math, because of typically I would say, you want to, once you have, you're fully funding your retirement accounts, you're fully funding your, your investment accounts, and you have that excess capital, we would accelerate the pay down of the debt. Mm-hmm. However, if you do the math on it, depending on your age, you would see that because we're in such a low interest rate environment, if you have a two and a half or a 3% mortgage, you actually would be better off paying that loan on a regular basis, Mm -hmm. taking the difference that you were gonna put against the loan and investing it. Mm -hmm. And down the road, the investments would have grown and then you can take a lump sum and pay the loan off or pay the loan down later down the road and you'll have more in that account than than you would have otherwise. And so Mm -hmm. when interest rates increase as they expect to be, and I don't know where that tipping point is, Right. Uh, yeah. So what if it's here? like four and a half percent interest rate? Say that again. What if it's like a four and a half percent? Interest so four and rate? a half, it becomes then a, a mathematical problem. And so mm-hmm. you may be right on the cusp of, of six and one half a dozen of the other. Okay? okay. And so what you end up dealing with then is some qualitative things. Mm-hmm. Is the debt causing you stress? Mm-hmm. Is the debt... Um, is, you know, are you at a stage in your life? If, for instance, say you're in your, your fifties. Okay. 
I want people when they're going into those later years to find themselves completely debt free. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you're in your 30s, you have you have your mortgage, I would actually put more money towards investing than I would towards the mortgage, because you're not going to touch it for for 20 years minimum, right? Well, the kind of growth you can have on investing would give you enough income or enough, you know, value and, and, and cash at some point in the future, 20 years down the road to pay the mortgage off early then, and still have some left over mm -hmm. 50, 50 year old or 55 year old or some, probably not. Right. So it's this, it's this dynamic between age and interest rate and what you think you can get in, in, in investments. So I typically at this stage, um, most cases, it's not going to make sense to pay off the mortgage early. Got it. As that long as, as long as what you're going to put towards the mortgage, you, you invest put it. towards investing. If <laughs> you, you sit back it. and go, Ooh, we're not paying the mortgage off and I go shopping. No, that's Different not, story. that's not what we're saying. <laughs> Got it. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, what's a good book that our listeners can read that could help them get started? I know your book is wonderful. So can we talk about your book actually? The The Entrepreneur Solution is yeah. great for entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. It's, it was the manual I wrote to my son. Wow. And uh, it was the manual I wrote to my son after my bike accident. And then a dear friend of mine, uh, Brendan Bouchard said to me, this is so good. You got to get it out in, into the world. And so that's how that book came about. Wow. Um, there will be another book coming. Exciting. That is, but it won't be till 2023 called Your, Your Money Plan Solution. Awesome. Um, so that that's on its way out. And then I have the Affluent Solution after that coming out. Wow. Um, Busy. But so, so there, there, I, I, I got, I got done with the cancer. I said, let's get back in the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes. I love it. Um, I think that it depends on where you want to focus. Mm -hmm. So if we want to understand more about, say, investing um, and ETFs, I would actually sp spend some time looking at uh, Bogleheads, Jack mm -hmm. Bogle's uh, uh, book uh, around that. Um, the, if you're looking for any of David Box stuff, I love David and I are dear friends. His stuff is really, really good when it comes to some of the money management uh, things. But then there'll be more specific things around like, do I want to understand more about crypto, which is changing every day. Mm -hmm. Then maybe we need to get some books on, on crypto or, or anything. The one warning I will give is always look to the bias mm -hmm. of the author, the teacher the person mm -hmm. and when i mean bias is how are they making their money mm -hmm. are they coming from a place of experience did they live it or is this conjecture is it because they want to sell a product is it because they want to sell like there's a lot of people out there that are trying to pitch oh you got to go into whole life insurance policies Okay. And I know I'm going to piss people off that are insurance agents out there, but the answer is no, you don't. Right. One of the worst things you can do in, in probably 98% of the cases um, is to allow an insurance company to become your investment, investing vehicle. You buy insurance for the purpose of insurance, mm -hmm. and then you invest outside of that, but they will pitch you on this whole life um, junk that is out there and they get huge comm commissions off of it. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, it's not the thing that you need. It's not the thing that is really appropriate. And mm -hmm. so I would be really cautious about the bias of the people that you're listening to. Are they selling something? Right. Um, are they getting paid in some way? Are they sponsoring something? So I would be careful about that. Um, so I, I would, I would start with, with that. If you're, if you got a ton of debt and you're trying to get out of it, look, um, Dave, Dave has got Dave Ramsey's book. He, he's gotten a lot of people out of debt. Um, yeah. if you're trying to build wealth and do something because you've gotten that foundation at, in play, 
then we need to start looking more towards a wealth creation type of work. If you're trying to, you're sitting back and saying, I got, I got money stories in my head and, and just so we're clear and you don't feel left out. We all do. Mm -hmm. And I do too. I love that you said that. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And, and the stories just change Mm -hmm. that there is, there is that Um, Heisel's book I think it's called Money Mind. I don't know why it's slipping my mind mind right now. It's called The Money Mind. Um, He does a really good job. Oh, The Psychology of Money. The Psychology of Money. What's his name? Uh, Heisel, H-I-E-Z-L. Let's see. Sci. That's one I have not read. And it's it's a relatively easy read too. Yeah, Psychology of Money um, is... uh, is the name. It's Morgan Heisel. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I feel like I could be sitting here for hours, um, just picking your brain and asking you more questions, but I know you are a very busy man. Uh, where can we connect with you? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, Mel Abraham nine. Okay. I don't know who the eight first eight are, but we're, <laughs> we're hunting them. We're, hunting them down. <laughs> we're coming after you if, if you're one of them. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm there, I have my show, the affluent entrepreneur show, uh, my website, melabraham.com, uh, my YouTube channel. We're doing a ton of stuff on YouTube right now. Uh, and, and also don't hesitate to reach out, to send a DM with Like I I've done a couple of episodes just as a result of questions being asked, because I want to make, what I want to do is I want to. I'm trying to create an environment of having safe, sane conversations around money, wealth creation, how it builds life, how it makes a difference, and to give you a place where, like I said, I, I, got, I got no investments to sell you. I just want you to, to realize that your dreams are a possibility. Your financial freedom is a birthright, and to give you a pathway to claim it uh, without the complications and the and, and the things that that some of the financial services industry puts in front of you. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. Um, we'll make sure to put everything in the show notes. Mel, you're awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my God, Rachel, thanks for having me on. This was great. <laughs>